continuing with our commentary on Mark, uh, I think this is session 17, uh, the cleansing of the leper. And uh, it shouldn't be that complicated. Um, it might get more involved in the next session with Mark 2, the healing of the paralytic. But um, this is a very interesting passage. And again, I'm, I'm sharing with you uh, the results of my doctoral dissertation research years ago. And then, you know, so maybe some further work on Mark. So I hope to keep it informal because uh, I have a tendency sometimes to get too technical. So if I keep it uh, rather informal and without uh, a lot of, you know, prior preparation uh, prior to each video, I rely on my uh, reservoir of many years of um, studying uh, these texts. So we have here uh, a leper, which, um, as you may know, uh, is a reference to a variety of skin diseases. It's not Hansen's disease, the, what we call leprosy now. It may have included that, uh, I guess, but it was basically some sort of, uh, you know, type of uh, death of the skin or... Uh, impurity in the sense of uh, decay and it could apply to clothes and walls and, and different objects but in the case of human beings it was uh, some people say psoriasis or eczema or some other type of um, skin disfigurement which I think in the Jewish uh, ritualistic uh, um, you know, metaphysics or religion regarding pure and impure, it uh, indicates death. And so that's uh, something that makes you impure. There are other things uh, regarding impurity that we could talk about. For example, uh, I think menstrual blood would have to be, would have to do with giving life or semen, for example, also is a type of life-giving uh, fluid and so therefore it, it renders you quote-unquote impure which is really also a, a strange translation in, in Jewish uh, purity uh, thought it has to do with something that renders you sort of unfit to continue participating in the temple rituals until a certain time has passed it's actually it's actually very interesting that touching holy books in Judaism made you in this sense uh, having to wash your hands it defiles your hands or makes your hands common is the expression for what happens when you handle the holy book so obviously that's not a dirty thing but it's like a touching the radioactive kind of nature uh, of the divine and re divine related but then there's the other thing which is death and decay and this is where the leprosy would come in and the re legislation regarding that is would be in Leviticus 14 so here you have a, a one of these individuals who has to be ostracized cannot participate in the temple cult he uh, approaches Jesus uh, uh, kneels to him uh, worships him etc and he says if you will you can make me clean uh, and Jesus moved with pity. Uh, this is what uh, most of the Bible scholars have decided is the, the better reading. I have to say, sort of by the way, that these are manuscripts that go back to uh, the first, second century. And uh, some of them read differently. And some manuscripts say he was angered. At this and uh, that's a very strange uh, reading but they, they've chosen that, that Jesus was moved with pity and he stretches out his hand and touches the leper so he's actually touching an impure person and uh, he has the power and ability to make him clean a very impure woman with a menstrual blood flow in chapter 5 is going to touch him and that also, uh, the whole, you know, a Jewish law would be, uh, you know, 
strict regulations on when a woman is menstruating, you can't sit in the same chair she she sat in and all that kind of stuff. There's a whole tractate in the Mishnah, Nida, which we don't have to get into now. So that uh, Jesus says to him, I will be clean. And immediately, there's another use of the mark in uh, Euthus, immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. So what Jesus has here done, this is like the first uh, miracle in Mark, except perhaps the exorcism in the, that we saw before, or maybe the fever uh, of Peter's mother-in-law, or the multiple uh, cures and um, exorcisms in the day in the life that we talked about also. But here you have a, a sort of a physical illness type healing and it's uh, significant because the leprosy, of course, would indicate uh, this um, ostracism from the cultic community. This man is an outcast, and now Jesus has facilitated his reintegration, which is something we need to talk about a little bit. But uh, in any case, uh, what Jesus does is, is really miraculous. He's actually immediately got, gotten this man rid of his skin condition, which is something that in the Old Testament uh, was not expected to be done, except maybe by God. It is not one of the works of the Messiah listed in Isaiah. Uh, when Naaman the leper comes to Elisha, uh, Elisha, I think, rends his clothing, or maybe it's the king, I forget now, but he goes, am I God to clean a leper? And of course, they tell Naaman to bathe in, in the river uh, Jordan, and, and he's cleaned that way. But the normal thing would be, according to Leviticus 14, for a, a person who somehow has overcome this skin condition to present himself to the priest for the priest to examine him and declare him clean and therefore readmit him to the cultic community. And if you looked at the uh, Leviticus 14 text, you would see that um, there's a lot of um, regulations. Looks like a very old ritual involving, uh, I think, a red string, the color red being uh, what they call a prophylactic or an apotropaic, uh, something that wards off evil. And you've got, uh, they, they, they let a bird go, uh, and you uh, would sacrifice two lambs, uh, male lambs and one female lamb. And uh, it's also uh, called, uh, this sacrifice is also called an asham, which is like a global guilt offering. That would be interesting because of the servant song. The fourth servant song speaks about if the servant gives his life as an asham. And uh, Jacob Milgram, um, the great expert on Leviticus, he too was at Berkeley, as I recall, um, speaks a lot about uh, these kinds of sacrifices, and especially the asham, which takes away guilt and not just removes the um, sort of like the bodily impurity, which sometimes could be called the chatat, uh, as in Leviticus, they also mentioned that kind of sin offering. Uh, the same word means both sin and sin offering, chatat. So what you have here is uh, something unusual, unheard of. A, a, a man being cleaned of leprosy by Jesus instead of by some miraculous washing in the Jordan or some other thing that uh, God has has um, ordered. And then uh, very interestingly, um, Jesus tells him, sternly charges him uh, to tell no one. He, well, he sent him, he cast him out at once. That's a very weird uh, way to say that. We have the repetition here of this word cast out. Here it says sent him away. But um, 
I sort of associated it with the Israelites being cast out of Egypt, you know, sort of cast out of slavery. But uh, it's interesting that uh, the Greek uh, does talk in terms of um, exebalen auton. He cast him out. Um, and most translations, even the Latin, doesn't quite go that far. It sounds very weird. He cast him out. You know, that doesn't sound too good. Um, and he said to him, say that you say nothing to anyone. So this is also the secret again. Uh, messianic secret or the nature of Christ, Jesus secret or, or son of God secret but it says show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing the sacrifice Moses commanded we have just been speaking about um, the Leviticus 14 series of sacrifices and if you were very poor and you couldn't afford lambs and things like that. You could offer even cereal or doves. And this is going to be relevant when we finally work our way to the Temple Act, where not large animals are mentioned, but doves. And in contrast to John, which has oxen and sheep and you know, large animals. In Mark, they just talk about doves, which would be the offering of the poor. That's what Jesus' parents offer for him, for his rescue. In, uh, in the Gospel of Luke, so that um, Jesus tells this guy to go show himself to the priest and offer the sacrifice. But then what's interesting is this one, this translation says, for a proof to them. And if you were to look at the Greek of it, it would say, eis martyrion autois. And this is the exact same three words that appear in two other places in Mark. The one that I think will give us the clue as to how to translate this if we were to um, be consistent in the translation. Some people may not choose to do that, but I think I'm following a scholar named Lloyd Gaston who suggested this. If you remember the... Um, instruction of Jesus, if a town doesn't accept you, uh, shake off the dust from your feet. And there it says, most translations there will say, as a testimony against them, or as a witness against them. And so this martyrion, where the word martyr comes from, this is the, the word for witness or testimony. And so the A's would be unto a testimony for them. But the A's here, uh, especially in Mark 6, verse 12, 11, is as a witness against them. And so um, that's one instance where it clearly is a sign of uh, contradiction or, or witness against somebody. The other place would be uh, in the eschatological discourse. Uh, Jesus says that, um, you know, you'll go before synagogues and, and, and uh, appear before governors and kings for my sake as a witness for them or against them. So according to, I think, Lloyd Gaston, if we translate it in each of these three instances as a witness against them, the idea would be that Jesus is telling this leper, go to the priest and show him what I have done as a witness against what priests do. Sort of like saying, I'm the, the new uh, Torah or the new order of things where you don't offer animal sacrifices. God is now healing lepers through me. This would be related to the temple act. If you remember the parallel sort of, or at least a similar passage in Luke, there's ten lepers, and Jesus tells them to go to the priest and, and offer the sacrifice, etc., and they all go on their way, except for one who is really incapable of doing what the others are doing, the Samaritan, he would not be accepted in the temple, so he has no reason to, to go to the temple and offer any uh, you know, ritual sacrifice according to the Jewish uh, laws. 
And so he's the one that returns and thanks Jesus, and Jesus praises him as the only one that came back, and he's a foreigner or Samaritan, etc. So uh, something similar is happening here. This man disobeys Jesus. He doesn't go to the priest <laughs> as a witness against him or anything. He goes there and begins to pre preach the news about Jesus. And so uh, he disobeys Jesus, but he's doing something that implicitly is commendable. He's uh, not following the Jewish ritual, but he's now preaching about what Jesus has done so that the point being that Jesus' fame extends uh, so much now that he, he can't really go freely uh, to everywhere. So I think we can stop there and... Um, and we've covered the leper, and, and then we continue with, with God's uh, help into Mark 2 and the paralytic, which is, which is very interesting.